to all those who devoted their lives to aviation. Wings of Russia Studio presents Wings of Russia documentary. A modern fighter is a combination of beauty and power, speed and maneuverability. Its flight fascinates audience in any air show and makes potential enemies new. A fighter has a hard task. It has to win a fight not only with the like, but with the aircraft of any other type. Everything progressive at the moment in the aviation science and technology is invested in the creation of a fighter. Researchers test in flight ever unknown and out of limit modes. The level of aviation development in the country is mostly determined by the ability to create a fighter of its own. Currently, the authority of the Russian school designing aircraft of this type is acknowledged worldwide. But that was not always so. This is a story of the Russian fighter development. Fighters. First victories. The very first aircraft had no specialization and therefore no qualification. People tried to put different constructions into the air, some of which had rather an exotic look. Making cuts and tries, pilots were mastering methods of piloting, while designers were trying to find the most applicable aircraft pattern. In other words, people were learning to fly. The miraculous qualities of the new type of technique could not leave the military indifferent. The first to go into service were air balloons and airships. From the altitude these flying machines could climb to, it was suitable to conduct reconnaissance and artillery fire adjustment. However, with the airplane's development and improvement, it became clear that they can do this job much more efficiently. It also became clear in Russia, where in 1910 the first military aviation training school appeared. Pilots trained in France became instructors. The first aircraft for the developing national military aviation were purchased abroad. Attempts were made to build such flying machines in Russia as well. From 1910 to 1913, there were even several contests of military airplanes organized. But in spite of all the efforts, Russian enthusiasts failed to create a flying machine which could compete with the foreign ones. And the chief commander of the Russian aviation, the Grand Duke Alexander Mikhailovich, did not bestow the national designers, preferring to buy aircraft and licenses for their production abroad. The First World War started in August 1914. Entente, the Triple Alliance of France, England and Russia, countered Germany and its allies. By the start of combat actions, the national aircraft stock amounted to slightly over 260 machines. Most of them had no arms. Machine guns were mounted on just several reconnaissance planes. At that time in Russia, the only standard weapon of the crew was the Mauser pistol, and the first air fights were ending up with hand-weapon shooting 
rattling maneuvers and battle fists shaking. In the Western and Eastern Front's pilots were trying to solve the armament problem of their airplanes independently. Interesting but useless were attempts of Pyotr Nesterov, one of the Aerobatics founders. In early August 1914, he installed a knife in the tailpiece of his Moran designated to cut cover of the enemy's air balloons. However, this was not put into practice. Nesterov's second invention was a long wire with a load, which he hoped to put over the propeller of the enemy's airplane. On August 26, 1914, the pilot attempted to test his invention in practice, but the wire broke at takeoff. In his second flight of the same day, Nesterov met an Austrian Albatross reconnaissance airplane. Having no other means of stopping the enemies, Nesterov made a desperate move, a ram attack. Both pilots died. Soon another Russian pilot, Lieutenant Alexander Kozakov, repeated the legendary deed. He managed not only to put the enemy's albatross down in a ram attack, but to land his damaged airplane successfully. Pilots repeatedly tried to mount a machine gun on the airplane, the most efficient weapon in a fleeting air combat. The best way to attack an enemy airplane was then thought to be from back below. Therefore, the machine gun was put at an angle upwards so that the line of fire to go over the propeller. The first air battles showed that it was absolutely inconvenient and the weapons were faced forward while aiming was done through airplane maneuvering. Shooting was again performed over the propeller from a weapon mounted on an upper wing. Such scheme was no better for shooting. Besides, the pilot had to reload by standing up, holding the control gear with his legs. It was only left to install the weapon right in front of the pilot and shoot right through the propeller. But how not to damage it? The first one to solve this task was a French military pilot, Roland Garot, who was a renowned sports pilot. He installed steel deflectors on the screw blades to keep them from damage. In spring 1915, Garot won several air fights on a Moran Solnia airplane equipped with a machine gun shooting through the propeller. Soon the secret of his Moran became known to the enemies. But Germans did not copy the French invention considering it to be non-efficient they started to develop a shooting through propeller device of their own. A German engineer, Schneider, invented a firing synchronizer, which was delaying a shot the moment propeller blade passes the line of fire. Designer Anthony Fokker installed this device on his Eindecker monoplane. In summer 1915, airplanes with a synchronizer showed their advantages in air combat. Aiming became very comfortable for the pilot. Destruction of the like in the air with the help of the onboard shooting defined the birth of the new combat aircraft class, the fighters. While Moran Saulnier and Fokker Eindecker can be named the first in the world fighters. In the end of 1915, the Russian military pilot Viktor Dubovsky, independently from the Germans and the Allies, designed a synchronizer of his own, 
which however did not receive any wide use. Combat activities of those times had their own peculiar features. Engines were often playing pranks and airplanes were getting out of order due to intensive use and bad weather since the main construction materials were wood and textile. Russian aviators had even more hardships. Russia was way behind Germany in the number and quality of its aircraft. Air Force units supply was poorly organized and totally depended upon deliveries from abroad. Any flight was already a great risk. Technical deficiencies were covered by permanent tension, courage and often heroism of the Russian pilots. Meanwhile, in the Western Front, monoplanes gave way to more maneuverable biplanes such as the French Newport Bebe or Baby and its successor Newport 17, the German Albatross D and the English Pop, Camel and Snipe of the Sopwich Company. Designers of the latter attempting to improve maneuverability created a triplane. According to its trophy sample, the Germans built their Dry Decker, one of the notorious symbols of the First World War. In Russia, foreign machines made the basis of the aircraft stock. Numerous attempts were made to build our own aircraft and the fighter in particular. The first Russian airplanes were often designed and built upon a private initiative and on private funds. One of them, the MB-2 BIS, was designed by Italian Francesco Mosca. The aircraft was manufactured in series from 1917 at a factory in Moscow. The Sikorsky S-16 biplane fighter also appeared with no support from the Supreme Commander. Businessman and organizer of the Ilya Muromets aircraft squad Mikhail Shedlovsky funded S-16 fighter with his own money. This aircraft was part of the squad as a trainer and an escort fighter. However, due to technical imperfection and middling flight characteristics, it could not become a deserved competitor to German Fokkers and Albatrosses. The problem was in the engines, which Russia did not produce. Both aircraft had to be equipped with the available low-power French engines incapable of providing for the sufficient speed. In such conditions, the national constructions could not compete with the foreign aircraft. The struggle for the air superiority in the Russian front became especially acute in spring 1916. In this connection, the fighter aviation gained a special status and became independent. Fighter units were formed, although they were staffed with the normally outdated Newport 10 and SPAD A2. Situation started to improve only by the end of summer, when units were supplied with the Newport Bebe aircraft. They were equipped with the upper wing based non synchronized machine guns. But with all the inefficiency of such weapons allocation, the Russian pilots succeeded in winning air battles. One of the first to open his winning account was commander of the second fighter air unit, Captain Yevgraf Krutin, bringing down a German reconnaissance aircraft. Creation of the fighter aircraft group started in the end of summer 1916, each comprising several air units. New formations proved to be more efficient and influenced the air situation at important sections of the front. Air battles intensity grew up significantly.
Soon, the first publications on the tactics and combat application of fighters appeared in Russia, written by the Russian military pilots. Yevgraf Krutin became the most productive author. Analyzing its own combat experience, he worked out principles of the fighter unit's organization, published works on tactics, described methods of air attacks and exits therefrom. Besides understanding the importance of the issue, Krutin proposed to open an aerobatic school in Russia for training fighter pilots. In the years of war, Russia showed the world a lot of examples of courage and high spirit. Yuri Gilsher, despite amputated foot, returned to the handwheel and won three air battles. Another hero, the Marine pilot Alexander Prokofiev Seversky, also flying with an artificial limb, won 13 battles. But the most successful Russian ace was the commander of the first combat aircraft group Alexander Kozakov, who brought down 20 enemy's aircraft, the first of which by a ram attack. The war was coming to an end. The fighter, as its creation, occupied its deserved place among aircraft of other designations. The best fighters of the First World War may be named the French SPAD-13, the English SC-5, and the German Fokker D-7. They all appeared in 1917 and each was produced in a series of several thousands of copies. Experience of the First World War showed how important aviation was. Therefore, right after October 17, for the protection of the revolution, the Bolsheviks needed armaments, including combat aircraft. But such plans were hard to be carried out. In the chaos of the Civil War, nobody was thinking of aviation. Only after the end of it, the young Soviet Republic announced development of the Air Force as one of its main tasks. The country was surrounded by a hostile capitalist neighborhood. However, money is beyond politics, and before constructions of its own started to appear, the Soviet government continued to buy combat aircraft, engines, and licenses for their production from the very same neighborhood. The first Soviet fighters were designed under the guidance of Nikolai Polikarpov and Dmitry Grigorovich. In the beginning of the 20s, production of Liberty, a powerful American liquid-cooled engine, was mastered in Russia. New aircraft were being built to comply with this engine. Most of the foreign fighters were based upon a biplane scheme. While Polikarpov was designing its IL-400, a fighter with a 400-horsepower Liberty engine, as cantilever monoplane. Its wing did not have wing struts and wire braces, which made the drag significantly lower and enabled to obtain better flight characteristics and speed in the first place. The rated speed was 260 km per hour, which was very high for those times. By summer 1923, the aircraft was ready. Konstantin Artsyulov, one of the first Russian pilots, was assigned to test the aircraft. The very first flight ended almost in a tragedy. Right after takeoff, the IL-400 went straight upwards, the speed dropped, the aircraft floated in the air and then crushed from a minor altitude. Artsyulov's professionalism saved his life while the aircraft was lost. The reason of the wreck was an excessive tail heaviness. In the air, the aircraft is supported by the wing, and construction elements in front and in the rear of the wing must be balanced. The tail heaviness means that the front was heavier than the rear. 
When that was discovered, relevant recommendations were made for the designers. A year after, tests of the second IL-400 started, and the deficiencies of the first aircraft were eliminated. Pilots noted that the aircraft was good at aerobatics and under better control. The Air Force immediately ordered 33 copies of the fighter, which was identified as E-1. Its production started in 1926. However, unlike the tested machine, serial aircraft were rough, heavier, and the center of gravity was again shifted backward. During tests, the fighter flown by Mikhail Gromov did not manage to exit the spin and the pilot had to jump with the parachute. The aircraft was deemed dangerous and was not accepted for service. Thus, the first attempt of making the Russian monoplane fighter was a failure. However, its production and tests showed that an aircraft design is a serious matter requiring aerodynamic simulation research, strength tests, and many other things. From the very beginning of the fighter's history, attempts were made to use the monoplane scheme which promised to be more advantageous than the biplane scheme. That's how it was in the beginning of the First World War and with the Polycarpov's IL-400. Those attempts could not be called successful. The technical level will progress only by mid-30s. That's when monoplanes started to dominate in the fighter aviation. While Polycarpov experimented with a monoplane, Dmitry Grigorovich built a classical biplane fighter identified in serial production as E-2. The aircraft did not succeed from the start and required refinement. But even after that, it did not comply with the set requirements. The reason was in the low power engines. But in order to get rid of the foreign dependence, this fighter was put into commercial production and accepted for service. The next in row to be accepted for service were E-3 and E-4 fighters. The Polycarpov's E-3 biplane had a wooden construction and was equipped with the M-17 liquid-cooled engine. For its time, it was the fastest Soviet aircraft. With this aircraft, Mikhail Gromov reached 290 km per hour. From 1928, the aircraft started to arrive to the aviation units. Almost 400 copies of this aircraft were produced. E-4, made by the construction team of Pavel Suhoi under the Tupolev general supervision, became the first Soviet all-metal construction fighter. It had M-22 air-cooled engine. It was also used in such an exotic project as the wing aircraft. Two E-4s were put on a TB-1 heavy bomber's wing and could detach in the air to perform independent flight. In spring 1930, pilot Benedikt Buchholz, in presence of the government members, raised the new E-5 fighter into the air from the Hadinka Central Airdrome. The rudder was decorated with letters VT, deciphered as internal prison. The reason was that designers Polikarpov and Grigorovich as alien social elements by that time found themselves in prison where they in fact designed the E-5. This was one of the first NKVD attempts to set control over aircraft designers with the help of repressions which later became massive. Interesting to know that distrusting Soviet designers, the Soviet government ordered a German engineer Ernst Heinkel to develop the fighter. The latter made an aircraft defined as E-7, which was accepted for service in the Red Army. 
However, E5 entering service a bit later in many parameters left the Heinkel's aircraft behind and became the best Soviet fighter of the early 30s. A dilemma emerged in the early 20s. Which fighters are better, the monoplanes or biplane? Up to the Second World War, the fighter's evolution went in both directions. And while in the 20s monoplanes could hardly compete with the biplanes from the early 30s, with the appearance of perspective machines, the monoplane scheme started to dominate. High speed of those aircraft was particularly achieved at the expense of maneuverability. Therefore, a classification was adopted in the Soviet Union according to which traditional biplane fighters were called maneuverable, while the new monoplanes were called fast speed. E-15 was one of the best Soviet maneuverable fighters. It was created under the guidance of Nikolai Polikarpov. Its scheme and construction represented a refurbishment of the E-5 biplane. However, the upper wing of E-15 was made in a seagull type, thus the drag was reduced and the forward and upward visibility was significantly improved, which was very important for combat conditions. Installation of a new 700 horsepower engine became a significant improvement of the E-15 flight characteristics. The aircraft was armed with two synchronized machine guns. Flight tests of the aircraft's trial copy were completed in the end of 1933. On November 21, 1935, flying a lightweight version of this aircraft, Vladimir Kokinaki established a world record reaching an altitude of 14,575 meters. Further improvement of the Soviet maneuverable fighters followed the path of the successful E-15. Its modification E-15Bs was put into production in 1937. The upper wing Seagull was straightened up, construction reinforced, and instead of two, there were now four machine guns. Among the entire variety of fighters, there were several two-seat aircraft. The firing abilities of the aircraft were thought to be increased at the appearance of the second crew member, the marksman. But this benefit was gained at the expense of the weight increase and reduction of flight showings. Attempts to make a two-seat fighter in the USSR were unsuccessful until a certain moment. Only in 1935, designers Kochirigin and Yitsenka managed to design a more or less good aircraft of this type. It was named DE-6, and the main reason for its success was the perfect aerodynamic. As to speed, DE-6 was beyond even the one-seat E-15. However, in future, two-seat fighters did not receive as much distribution as the one-seat aircraft. In the early 30s, works to create fighter monoplanes accelerated. Under the leadership of Grigorovich Tupolev and Polikarpov, three types of fast-speed fighters were developed. E-14, E-16, and E-P-1. They were put on tests one after another, upgraded in parallel, and there was to an extent competition between them. Among these contenders struggling to be named the fastest fighter, the Polycarpov's E-16 was the most successful. It was the first to appear among its counterparties. The first sample, E-16, took off on December 30, 1933. The factory tests were performed by Valery Chkalov, while the state tests were conducted by Vladimir Kokinaki and Vasily Stepanchonok. 
The fighter turned to be rather strict in control and demanded precise coordination of the pilot's movements. In other words, E-16 required pilots with at least mid-level or even higher qualification, which of course was not an advantage of the new aircraft. However, this feature was neglected since during tests the aircraft showed good speed characteristics. Minor defects were being eliminated in the course of the tests and commissioning. Despite the military's interest, E-16 did not receive immediate use in the Air Force. It needed large airdromes and only upon the completion of runways in the end of 1935, E-16 started to appear in the combat units. Various E-16 modifications were identified by adding a type number. They differed by the engine brand, armament and constructive peculiarities. E-16 Type 5 became one of the most popular modifications, equipped with the M25A engine. First modification had closed cockpit, however pilots as a rule flew with the open canopy, worrying that the sliding part may not work in a critical situation and the plexiglass quality was not the best. Later on, production of open cockpit aircraft started. This increased the drag and reduced the speed, however flying characteristics still remained very high. E-16 was armed with two Schkass machine guns. This weapon had an outstanding for those times firing rate, 1800 rounds per minute. Although pilots noted insufficient firepower of the fighter, therefore Polykarpov offered E-16 armed with cannons in addition to machine guns. Two 20mm cannons were installed in the wing and E-16 Type 12 became the first Soviet serial fighter with cannon armament. Cannon versions of the e shock as E-16 was lovingly called, were designated first of all to fight bombers. They were also used for attack actions. There were also two seat training E-16, the so-called dual cockpits. The most mass dual cockpit was UTI-4. It played a huge role in training crews for flights on fast speed fighter. Starting from 1935, the Red 5 was showing its flight art at the Red Square parades and at air shows in Tushina. That's how the E-16 aerobatic group was called. For most of the pilots, the right to fly in the Red 5 was the highest assessment of their professional skills. The group aerobatics on those aircraft could be performed only by first-class pilots. And what's up with the E-16 competitors? Tupolev started developing a high-speed fighter even before Polycarpa. Andrei Tupolev, by that time already a venerable designer, could allow himself to make a new all-metal aircraft. It was the first fighter in the Soviet Union with a retractable landing gear. In May 1933, E-14 took off for the first time. During tests, some of the deficiencies were disclosed, but they were eliminated only by 1937. By that time, E-16 was already servicing in the combat units and production of another fighter seemed inexpedient. The other contender was the Grigorovich's EP-1 fighter. This aircraft had one peculiar feature, the recoilless cannon. Developed by Leonid Kurchevsky in the early 30s, these cannons became popular in the USSR. Being relatively lightweight, they could have large caliber and relevant destructive ability. It was quite clear that the military wanted to install new weapons on fighters. 
two aircraft equipped with these cannons were built in 1931, the E-12 of Tsagi and the Grigorovich's EZ fighter. Both aircraft were experimental. Grigorovich continued his research and in 1934 created EP-1 fighter equipped with two such cannons and the Shkas machine gun. However, Kurchevsky's cannons did not prove themselves. They had minor efficiency and caused high aerodynamic drag. Besides, in other parameters, EP-1 was inferior to E-16. The subject was closed. In the second half of the 30s, the Soviet Union took active participation in a number of minor wars, getting a chance to test in battles both maneuverable and fast-speed fighters. In autumn 1936, the civil war in Spain started. Soviet volunteers went to help the Republicans. USSR sent its military technique as well. In the Spanish sky, the E-15 biplanes met with the aircraft of Franco. Combat capabilities of the Chatos, how the Spanish called E-15, appeared to be much higher than of the enemy fighters, the Italian Fiat CR-32 and the German Heinkel 51. In the air battles, combat aircraft revealed their strong and weak points, improving methods of air fights. In Spain, for instance, pilots apply tactics of interaction of maneuverable E-15s with a fast E-16. The task of the fast fighters was to catch up with the enemy and get engaged in a combat. After that, the maneuverable E-15s would pick up the relay, while the E-16s would be free to attack the bombers. E-16 appeared in Spain in 1937. It was then that the first in history air battles between the fast-speed monoplanes took place. The Soviet fighters were countered by the German Messerschmitt Bf 109. This all-metal aircraft was a new dawn for the fighter aviation. It comprised almost all features of a fast-speed monoplane – excessive wing loading, retractable landing gear, closed canopy. Unlike E-16, BF-109 had a liquid cooling engine. Such engine has smaller gross section providing the fighter to have a more streamlined form. Combat actions showed that in terms of speed, the first version of Messerschmitt did not have any advantages over E-16 and was inferior in climb rate and armament. In terms of combat efficiency, both aircraft were very close to each other and success often depended on the pilot's skills and combat tactics. Installation of a new 1000 horsepower engine on the new version of Messerschmitt provided for the blunt improvement of all its flight characteristics. The speed of the modernized BF-109E increased to 550 km per hour. But those aircraft almost did not have to fight in Spain. The civil war in Spain ended on April 1, 1939. At that time, BF-109E was standing alone as to its combat qualities. Polikarpov made an interesting attempt to produce a similar fast-speed fighter. The aircraft was identified as E-17, one revolutionary point differed it from the German aircraft. A Schwag cannon was installed in the V of the M100 engine, which barrel went through the hollow propeller gearbox shaft. Such armament allocation had important advantages and was first time used on a Soviet fighter. The central cannon did not need any synchronizer, and its firing rate was higher. 
E-17 went on tests in 1935. Due to a number of difficulties, they dragged on and in 1939 the People's Commissariat of Aviation Industry considered the aircraft as morally outdated. While trying to find a way of reducing the drag, there emerged an idea of removing the air cooler from the air stream. Such projects were considered by various design bureaus. The Illusion Design Bureau created E-21 fighter. In this aircraft, the center wing surface served as the air cooler. The water heated in the engine, or rather the steam, touching the inside of such surface, cooled down and went back to the engine. For the first time in the Soviet Union, such system was implemented on the Stahl-6 aircraft designed by Roberto Bartini, a Soviet designer of Italian origin. In 1933, this experimental aircraft reached a phenomenal speed of 420 km per hour. However, very soon it became clear that the steam cooling system, due to its vulnerability, was not suitable for a combat aircraft. Thus, the Illusion E-21 subject did not find any continuation. In the meantime, fighters serving in the Soviet Air Force were undergoing combat examination. After Spain, E-16 managed to fight in China with the first Japanese monoplane fighters Mitsubishi E-96. This aircraft had non-retractable landing gear and was losing to the Soviet fighter in speed. However, it had good maneuverability and was accessible to pilots of lower qualification, thus standing out of E-16. During the Hulking Gold conflict in May 1939, another Japanese competitor to E-16 was the E-97 fighter of the Nakajima company. This aircraft was a serious counterparty. Radio stations on board Japanese fighters provided for the coordinated combat actions, while Soviet pilots had to do without the radio. E-15 BIS biplanes took part in the halting goal as well. By that time, combat capabilities of the BIS became insufficient to fight Japanese monoplane fighters. Moreover, the BIS could not catch up with most of the new types of bombers. That seemed to be the end. The slow biplanes were supposed to go. But no. There, at Halkin Goal, another Soviet biplane showed the best of its qualities. In 1937, when E-15 BIS was just put into serial production, the Polycarpov Design Bureau already developed a new version of maneuverable fighter defined as E-153. The idea was simple. To achieve the highest speed increase by means of air dynamics, preserving high maneuverability at the same time. In order to reduce aerodynamic drag, designers returned to the Seagull scheme. But the most important thing was that the fighter was equipped with retractable landing gear. In 1938, one of the first Seagulls, as this fighter was called, reached the speed of 425 km per hour. This was only 20 km per hour less than of the fast speed E-16 monoplane with the same engine. Soon, E-153 was equipped with a more powerful and altitude engine with a variable pitch propeller. This allowed to improve the rate of climb, reduce the takeoff run, and increase the ceiling. The aircraft was armed with four Schkass machine guns. Half a year after its serial commission, the Seagull was fire seasoned in the sky of Mongolia where it proved its right to stay. The E-153 biplane fighter was an example of its scheme perfection. But Polycarpov did not stop to rest. 
E-190, which emerged in the very end of 1939, had a record-breaking ceiling of 12,400 meters and a speed of 450 kilometers per hour. However, by that time, this kind of speed was already insufficient. USSR's experience of local wars and conflicts allowed to identify further steps in the aviation development and fighters in particular. After Spain, for example, armored back seats were introduced to protect the pilot from beneath and from the back. A new type of weapons, the jet projectiles, were tested in the real combat actions of Hulk and Goal after which they were recommended for utilization on nearly all types of the Soviet fighters. The new and more powerful engines were supposed to make the basis for the fighters' further improvement. Wide implementation in the second half of the 30s was enjoyed by the two-row air-cooled radial engines, which having the same cross dimensions were much more powerful. This motor was meant for the new E-180 fighter of the Polycarpov Design Bureau, which was supposed to substitute E-16. The first flight of this experimental fighter took place in a frosty day of December 15, 1938. The engine stopped due to overcooling. Pilots' attempts to reach the airfield were in vain. Valery Chkalov, piloting the aircraft, a hero and the country's favorite, died. After this catastrophe, it became clear that to obtain the new fighter so much required by the Soviet Air Force will be impossible. The accident with E-180 turned into a tragedy not only for the pilot, but for the aircraft creators. In the spirits of those times, they were the ones to blame. But it was just a minor episode in a huge wave of repressions breaking down the most talented and active personalities, including designers and officers. And it was one of the basic reasons for the catastrophic incompliance of the Soviet aviation with the spirit of times. From 1933, when the Nazis came to power in Germany, the world lived in a presentiment of a big war and the leading aviation powers were getting ready for it. They placed their stakes on the monoplane fighter. Prototypes of most of the fighters which became famous in the Second World War performed their first flights before the war. Among them were the British Hurricane and Spitfire, the American Air Cobra and Kitty Hawk, the Italian Fiat G50 and Maki 200, the Japanese Kayabusa and Zero, the German Focke-Wolf 190 and already mentioned Messerschmitt. What the Soviet Union had at this point? Thousands of hard-to-handle E-16s, thousands of slow-speed biplanes and in perspective, persistent attempts to create an outstanding biplane and modernize the same E-16 which is rather old and outdated. In spring 1939, Stalin decided to get a personal sense of the new aircraft development and summoned a huge conference in Kremlin inviting designers and captains of the aviation industry as well as representatives of the piloting and commanding personnel of the Air Force. In result of the conference, 12 design groups were given assignments to design new fighters. In essence, it was a tender in which many of the Soviet aircraft designers took part. A lot of different constructions appeared in result. Mikhail Pashinyan proposed a classic E-21 monoplane fighter. Alexei Borovkov and Ilya Florov designed E-207, which uniqueness was that the biplane cell had no bars and wire braces.
Design Bureau of Alexander Moskolev developed a Sam-13 aircraft, which engines were installed in a tandem in front and in the back of the cabin. The most interesting was an ES fighter construction developed by pilot Shevchenko and designer Nikitin. The lower wing of this biplane was folding up in flight. So it was taking off and landing as a biplane while turning into a monoplane in the air, it could show its best speed characteristics. However, all these exotic designs, to this or that reason, did not get any progress. What the result of the tender was, which way the fighter evolution went, and how advanced in the years of war it became, you will know from our next film.